Thank you. Uh, thanks, Anna. Uh, and actually, I, I do remember the day when Anna walked into my office and I did call her an ultra-conservative right-wing Christian fundamentalist. And, <laughs> and she said, yeah. Uh, and we've had a great relationship uh, along the way and uh, certainly as my, one of my first thesis students and now a multiple award winner herself, a 3M award winner, and now the uh, Associate Vice President of Teaching and Learning, the student has certainly surpassed the teacher. So thank you for that nice introduction. I'd also like to thank the Center for Pedagogical Innovation for creating uh, a couple of weeks of stress and anxiety <laughs> in order to do this, but I I'm really pleased because when Barry said, is there anything that you need in this uh, room, and I said, well, yeah, we need an overhead projector. <laughs> and uh, Barry, of course, laughed because he's a guru of technology. But the, the overhead projector was actually made as a teaching tool. All the computer stuff is just applications. So when all else fails, this works. And uh, just to tell you a little side story, I, I was given a class in another part of the room, or a part of the uh, university, and I, I made the, the leap to technology, put everything on the little rocket stick, walked up to uh, J404, and there is a chalkboard and an overhead projector. And I uh, wasn't smart enough on that very first lecture to have put it all on overhead so that at least now I had to wing it. So I got nowhere to plug it in, so now I'm gonna talk for a little while. So anyway, um, there's that. And this room brings back great memories when I was teaching in uh, phys ed and there were 300 students in the class. And I remember it was after reading week and a fellow came in that door over there and came right down and got to about the row here and did the shuffle thing, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me and sat down right where you're sitting, right there with the black and white. And uh, so we were doing neuroanatomy in terms of skill acquisition, parts of the brain function, this, that, and the other thing. And after about 20 minutes, I could see this student getting a little agitated, and, and I'm thinking, boy, I really got him. So uh, finally, I, I gave him the, I, I got you. And then I said, yes, uh, what's your question? Is this geography 190? <laughs> um, no, actually, it's not. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> and away he went. I, uh, I've actually, uh, one of the things that uh, I thought I was doing a pretty good job, this is anxiety inducing, and I thought I was doing a pretty good job of controlling my nervousness until the break after David's lecture, and I found myself walking into the women's washroom. <laughs> I would be remiss though that uh, if, as Anna has done, if I did not acknowledge uh, Dr. Arnie Lohenberger. Arnie had the, uh, maybe wisdom is the wrong word, but Arnie hired me 40 years ago. <laughs> and uh, it, is a, it is an honor to have you here, sir. Um, I remember distinctly the interview. We talked about everything under the sun except teaching. And finally, after about an hour and a half, I said, I don't think I've told you anything about the job. He said, well, simply, I want somebody that can do the work and is willing to work hard. And my response was, well, if I didn't think I could do that, I wouldn't be here. And then I got the phone call two weeks later. In 40 years, uh, the man that hired me is here on my exit lecture, and I am honored to have you here. Thank you, Arnie. Like David, uh, when Barry Joe called me, in, well, he didn't call me into his office, I was in his office. He didn't call me, I was in his office, and he said, well, how would you like to do the last lecture? I said, uh, okay, sure, but what is it you want me to talk about? He said, well, anything you want. I said, really? Yeah, he said, it's, it's wide open. I said, oh, okay. And now I have a good deal more empathy for my students when I give them an open-ended assignment because <laughs> after 40 years, how do you condense that down to uh, basically the two hours and 10 minutes that they've allocated for my talk? <laughs> However, uh, unlike David, I had uh, no trouble coming up with a title. 
So sit back and enjoy my lecture on piscatorial plenitude in Lake Erie, the effect of foreign invasive species on spawning success in native fishes, a fact-finding mission. <laughs> or not. The last lecture, though, sounds somewhat ominous. And uh, in fact, it's, it's a big task. And like David, I did go to the website and see what this was all about. We're all aware of Randy Posh and, uh, and certainly the uh, significant event that that was in terms of his uh, retirement or his last lecture. And, and when you use the word lecture, I felt that there should be some sort of content base in there. And that somehow or other, I needed to be profound. And uh, I remember being asked to speak at another venue and somebody said, well, that's a shame that I'm not speaking because I have so many profound things to say. And I'm not sure that profound and Lauren Adams has ever been used together in the same sentence. However, I did feel that I should provide some, as David has used, pearls of wisdom, something pithy. Not like the student said, the course of pithy and the seminar sucks too. <laughs> So what do I know that I could communicate to you? And the problem that I have is that after 40 years, I'm somewhat alarmed at how little I really know. The thing that I do know best is my experience here and my uh, interaction with both faculty and certainly students. I've had the privilege, and there are only uh, SIDS here somewhere, uh, a couple of us that have worked with all of the presidents of Brock University. So let me give you a little bit of context. When I started here in 1974, gas was 65 cents a gallon. Metrification uh, was in place, but it hadn't been instituted across the board yet. Pierre Trudeau was the prime minister. Richard Nixon resigned as president of the United States in August. 45 RPM and 33 RPM vinyl records were still available. For some of you in the room, they were things that created music. <laughs> Eight track tapes were new and the thing of uh, the future. The minimum wage was $2. The uh, department in those days, we called them secretaries. We're still using typewriters and electric typewriters were just being introduced. Course outlines were done by a Gestetner, which is another vocabulary item some of you won't recognize. But it basically consisted of a drum where you put stuff on and there was this purple ink. And if you went back into the Gestetner room and ran off um, course outlines, yeah, basically you were blowing off the rest of the afternoon because you're a hammer. <laughs> the courses for uh, when I started, the courses for uh, third year were proposed but not yet developed. There were five faculty in the Department of Physical Education. I'm the last one. There were 1,200 students at Brock and 300 faculty and staff. I had hair and handlebar mustache. <laughs> I was a lot thinner. And in fact, I had the, uh, the privilege of working uh, in the early years with Don Arsino. We taught a gifted kids program on Saturday mornings which was a, an honor to teach because Don has always been acknowledged as one of the great teachers at this institution. And, and we worked together, which was a good thing. And then my son came down for the weekend and he happened to run into a student and um, he said that he had gone to this Saturday morning gifted program. And at the time I was bodybuilding and had 7% body fat. Don Arsino was 6'3 and 120 pounds. And the student's comment, and my son said, well, my dad taught in that program. And the kid said, well, which one was your dad? The tall, skinny one or the short, fat one? <laughs> I was young, I was idealistic, and thought I had a handle on teaching. Of course, I, like everybody else, that's all I'd known for 24 years. I've been on the receiving end of it. I, I got this down, Jack. I wasn't prepared, though, for the problems that would be associated with a new teacher. While I have been the recipient of a number of teaching awards, as Anna has mentioned, it really didn't start out so well. Two weeks before school started, Arnie told me that I would be teaching a course that I'd never had a course in, and oh, by the way, the textbook has already been ordered, uh, which was great. 
So uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, lecture preparation. And then at the end of the term, evaluation time. I still have those from that. Here's a sample. I wouldn't recommend this course to my worst enemy. <laughs> I feel sorry for students who have to take this course. God help them. <laughs> this course and the instructor are all up. <laughs> and then my all-time favorite, this course could be taught better by a $2 an hour immigrant. Certainly not a confidence builder, but luckily, after Christmas, I got to teach something that I at least had some background in, and things, I think, have gotten a little bit better. Over the years, though, I have been alarmed by and heard these kinds of comments too often. This job would be a lot easier if it weren't for students. There are, I have, so many problem students. Half of the students shouldn't even be here. I only want to deal with grad students. And then one of the ones that, that I've used at the TA workshops, I was standing at a, at a notice board outside of a classroom, and the kids were filing, kids, that's a vocabulary item I can't get rid of, were filing into class, and they all sat down, and the instructor started, mm, Adams, Lauren. Oh, Lauren, nice to see you. Bell, Amy, Amy, no Amy, Crookshank, Susie, Susie, oh Susie, De Batista, David, anybody know David, anybody seen David, is this getting painful, <laughs> he went through and finally he hit one of the girls, and I can't remember her name. She said, sir, it's the second week after reading week. There's 14 of us. You should know our names. Wow. And then the other thing that happened, oh, all right. Um, any questions on the readings? They're quite good, you know. No questions? All right, we'll see you next week. That's an abdication of responsibility. And it happens all too often. So what am I going to focus on? Students. I've shared the confidence and the confidences of students for almost 40 years. For whatever reason, I seem to have been able to make that connection. I believe in the centrality of students in the mission of the university. They have been the touchstone of my career. I didn't realize, however, that my relationship with students was noteworthy until I was uh, given the opportunity to go to a talk by someone who I admired and respected greatly, one David Batista. And I was surprised and somewhat shocked to hear my name used in that presentation. And it was, as David referred to, you gotta know, you gotta be like Lauren Adams, you gotta know what you can get away with. I had never thought of myself in those terms. However, as I told David, the cartoon that he put up earlier, I caught myself in the hallway saying almost literally what that cartoon said. I passed the student, I said, hey, did you put your brain in neutral when you wrote that test? And uh, comments like that um, were uh, sort of, if you will, the norm. And I remember one day we were talking about haptic memory, about how sometimes when we do things, uh, we, we get a quick vision of something and it leaves a little memory trace and we were doing this, that, and the other thing. So I walked over to the overhead and I said, well, I'm going to flash a little something for you. <laughs> and they, they did that, they broke right down and uh, in paroxysms of laughter, so I couldn't help but join them. <laughs> Once they settled down, I said, all right, all right, all right, I'm gonna flash a little something for you and it happened all over again. And uh, one of the students who knew me fairly well walked up and said, sir, your fly is down. <laughs> so one of, the, uh, one of the things I'd like to address is, what is a student? This is a task that I asked my, uh, 
my reflective plaque, and that's on the exam. Make sure that you study it. <laughs> my reflective practice class to answer. I've done it at TA workshops on Saturday morning. What is a student? Oh, they do all sorts of things, and they uh, most often report all the stuff that you would expect to hear, or at least that they think I want to hear. So, that, you know, student is a learner, he's a problem, they are a problem solver, a decision maker, a goal setter, an achiever, they're flexible, they're hardworking, blah, 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 blah. In short, some malleable little mass of molecules that we get to work with. But after I put all the responses up on the board, I ask them, what's missing? And you get that go, the eyes are glazing over. What's missing? And then because most of them want to teach, I tell them about little Billy. Little Billy woke up in the morning pretty tired because his parents had been up fighting most of the night and he had to comfort his little sisters. So he goes down to uh, find a, something to wear and all he's got is wrinkled shirts, pick the one that seemed to be most clean. Down for breakfast, and he fought with his sister over who had the right to eat the cereal. Having won the fight, go to the fridge and there's no milk to put on it. Mom woke up from her slumber, giving him grief about fighting with his sister. Leave her alone. On the way to school, one of his friends passed comment on his wrinkly, unkempt look, and they had a little argument. And then they got to school, and in the course of the schoolyard, somebody asked if he had his homework done. He responded ra rather tartly that he didn't have it done. They made fun of his progress in school. So they had a fight. And the teacher on yard journey came over and said, Billy, not again. Come with me. You're going to the principal's office. He visited the principal and got the usual what for. Sent back to class, but his homeroom teacher didn't know what had gone on. Billy, you're late again. So now that means that you don't get to go out for recess. You're going to stay in with some of the kids and catch up. Oh, and you don't have your homework done? That means you're staying after class too. At lunchtime, Billy goes down to the lunchroom, but mom wasn't up. There wasn't anything to eat. So at lunch, sat by himself, tried to avoid confrontation with any of the other students. In the middle of the afternoon, about two o'clock, having been up most of the night comforting his sisters, Billy started to fall asleep at his desk. The teacher made note of that and embarrassed him in front of the rest of the class. Billy, what are you doing? Maybe you better go down and talk to the principal about your behavior. Principal Billy, not again. We're getting tired of this kind of thing. You see me one more time, we might have to suspend you from school. Now go back to your classroom and do your homework tonight. And on the way home, that's what's left. Those are the people in our classrooms. And it's not restricted to elementary school. I kept a journal of students that I counseled in trouble, or academic trouble. There are 104 entries in here. Every day, somebody came to see me. There's everything in here from, I can't keep up, I can't, make my, um, I can't meet my goals, to having been raped, seeking an abortion, relationship breakup, death of a parent, all of those kinds of things. Those are the people that are in our class. 
It's not restricted to the tired kids in elementary school. Kids that come to these classes are just as tired, have just as many problems. So, students have a history. It needs to be understood, it needs to be acknowledged, and it needs to be considered. And when somebody says, do you have the readings done? And the response is no, well then you can leave this classroom, you are once again abdicating your responsibility. I don't think there's a student anywhere in this world that goes home at night and goes, <laughs> I know what I'm going to do. That Lorne Adams, he's a 3M award winner. Well, let's just see how good he really is. Because I'm not doing anything to prepare for his class. I don't think there's one student in the world that has ever done that. They get a call from their boyfriend, their girlfriend, or both. It's a problem, the roommate needs some comforting, this, that, and the other thing. Not that they didn't intend to do the reading, but it doesn't get done. Now what do you do? So, students have a history. They never really stop to answer, well, it's me. Another instructive tool that I discovered was uh, we were having a discussion about teaching and learning. And as luck would have it in my reflective practice class, I told them what I would do is sometimes I would make things up on the spot and treat them as we're treated here as faculty. The dean walks into your office, the chair walks into your office and says, well, here, I need this on Friday. So I said, we will have throw-in assignments. So we were talking about teaching and learning. So I said to them, oh, here's what I want you to do for next class. I want you to write me a letter starting with Dear Lorne, telling me what I need to know about you as a learner. Some of you have written that letter. For those of you who want to try something, and um, as David said, make the, make the leap, take a risk, it is alarming. I was blown away by the honesty and the uh, self-reflection of those letters. Over the course of the years, I've examined those letters, and uh, well, it's not uh, grantable research, it is research of some sort. There are a couple of uh, main issues that arise. One, what students tell me, is they want a sense of belonging. A sense of, if you will, family. That I'm not just 4713362. That I'm actually Jane Doe, who took psychology 1F90, apparently. 223, whatever it was. They want us to understand that they lead busy, complex lives. And I'm amazed now at the kinds of things that students are involved in and the number of commitments that they have on top of their schoolwork. One of the students actually wrote, you keep talking about real life when it's you, the members of academe, which that need to understand what real life is. She had a sick mother, uh, absent father, um, critically ill brother. She was working a job. She was looking after her family. She was going to school and maintaining an 80% average. That's the real world. And then when it comes time to hand stuff in, perhaps she might need a break. As David said, a deal. Here's how I make a deal. I always assume that if you come to me, that there's a good reason. Why would you lie to me? You pay $417.64 for a course. So why would you lie to me? So if you come to me and say you need an extension, you've got it. But my deal is, I don't know what's going on in your life. You tell me when it's coming in. Well, can I have to tomorrow? Sure, if tomorrow is all you need. But if you tell me tomorrow and it comes in the day after, now you've broken a contract. So if you need till Thursday, tell me Thursday. If you need till Friday, tell me Friday. But then that's cast in stone. That's our deal. And it seems to work pretty well. So the other thing that students say is that they want to work hard. And uh, we've all heard, we all know, that there are things on this campus that I don't know what the vernacular is now, bird courses. Um, 
average boosters, whatever. But in reality, the kids don't like that. They want to work hard. And then as uh, one student said to me, uh, well, a number of students said, they just want to be taught well. Well, I'm not sure <laughs> what that entails, but that's an expectation. So my belief system has been formulated around those kinds of things. So I believe that the learner has a right to be involved in their own learning, that the journey should be challenging but enjoyable, equitable, and meaningful. I believe as an educator, we must be sensitive to the needs of the community of learners, but at the same time be responsible for constructing an environment that provides challenge, direction, and focus. I believe that given the opportunity, students will meet or exceed what is expected of them if they are engaged in a consultative process that allows them to assume some responsibility for their own learning. I believe that students learn best from examples that relate to their life world, their degree programs, or their career aspirations. And I teach a course on health issues. And uh, some people are shocked to find out that one of the topics on the course outline is abortion. And I, one, another one of my great failures was when I first put it on, I thought, well, here's what we'll do. We'll have a little debate. All of those of you who are pro-life, you go on this side of the room. And those of you who are pro-choice, you go on this side of the room, and we'll have a debate. It was a disaster. Why? Because all the people over here got people behind them believe the same thing they do. Yeah, you go get them. And they could say anything as outrageous as they wanted. And over on this side, they were just as fervent about what they believed. And it was this clash that just was a, a disaster. I'm embarrassed by it. However, as a consequence of the kinds of things that I've dealt with, now what we deal with is I tell them the story of students who sat in the same seats as they have. Now the abortion review board has gone the way of the carrier pigeon, but I set them up as a review board and say, here's the story. What do you do now? And that's a little different, you see, because people who've sat in that same room makes it a little more, if you will, real and relevant. I believe in the self-worth and dignity of the individual. The grades are not related to the worth of the student. And uh, I tell you that in the context of a student of mine, Vladimir Spehar. Vladimir was in my reflective practice course. There were only, it wasn't big, it was only about 60 students. But every day they had to do a journal. They had to show evidence of uh, preparation, so some synopsis of the reading, evidence of participation, some synopsis of class activity, and then a reflection about the day, and then at the end, this big reflection about the whole chocolate mess. And there, I allowed them to handwrite. And about, I don't know, halfway through, I came across the following sentence. Lorne, Lorne, Lorne. I can't really believe you're reading all of this. If you are, give me a sign. So at the end of his paper, I wrote, Vlad, Vlad, Vlad. <laughs> of course I read all this. Now you too will read all this. Your mark is somewhere in your paper. When you find it, give me a sign. <laughs> And actually, I, I told that story in another context, and Vladimir, who's living in Oakville, uh, showed up at my door. He said, you know what? I've never forgotten that, and you still got me. You're still telling stories on me. <laughs> I believe students have the right to know what their rights are. And I'm amazed at how often students have no sense of what their rights are in terms of dealing with either the rules or with us as faculty. I believe they have the right to know what fairness is that I will accept responsibility and that I am fallible. And to reiterate what David said earlier, I ask my classes and I've marked all the essays for classes of 200, whatever. Am I as fair on number three as I am on 13, as I am on 33, 
as I am on 53, as I am on 83, as I am on 103? And the answer, of course, is no. So your obligation and responsibility is to come to me and say, I think I've been unfairly dealt with. And unlike some of our colleagues who stand behind the podium and spread their feet and say, of course I'll mark your paper, but you'll take the second grade, whatever it is. <laughs> That's an abuse of power. So you have an obligation. If you feel you've been a, I can't justify to myself that I'm fair. So if you think I've been unfair, come and see me. We'll have a conversation. I will never lower your mark. And if I've given you too much, just consider it a gift for all the times you've been screwed before. I believe that the process of learning is more important than mere content. And David alluded to that and talked about it at length. I believe that failure, while not a desirable outcome, is nonetheless a legitimate outcome. And this is where the audience participation piece comes in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put up some numbers for you. And just like our little grade six class, or grade three class, whatever, I want you to add them up out loud in unison. Humor the old guy, it's my last lecture, all right? All right, so nice and loud. When you see the number, just add it up, okay? Seriously? I need to hear it. That's very good. You all worked very hard. And because redundancy is the key to learning, redundancy is the key to learning, and you don't have to repeat yourself, you don't have to repeat yourself. I didn't, I didn't. Let's do it again. Just to confirm that our answer is correct. Quickly, one. Well, you see, I use this little example with my classes because it's kind of interesting. How do I grade you? You all worked very hard. We tried, we did it as a group, this, that, and the other thing. However, the answer, <clears throat> the answer, puberty, <laughs> the answer, is 4,100. So if you got 5,000, wouldn't it be nice if your bank account worked that way? I'll just add it up and go, oh, look, 5,000, not 4,100. So how do I grade you? Well, the answer's wrong. Well, let's mark process. Well, your process was flawed. So, and it's just that things aren't as they appear. If we just reconfigure this, and you can do it in your head. If you go this way, add that column, add that column, add that column, you end up with 4,100, not 5,000. So, nobody fails. Everybody passes. It's become a mantra. And it doesn't work. Failure, while not a desirable outcome, is nonetheless a legitimate outcome. If, in fact, you learn from it. And to sum up my belief system, if you will, I uh, had some fourth year students over to my house for dinner one night. And they were from Toronto. Not that there's anything wrong with being from Toronto. Well, sort of there is, but anyway. Um, and they passed the comment that they'd never seen a deer. I said, what? Not even in a zoo. They'd never seen a deer. I said, really? Yeah, no, I'd never seen one. 
well, get in the car. It was just about dusk, whatever. So out we went to the back roads behind, uh, behind the university here. And it only took about five minutes. And there were three deer standing in a field. And I said, look, there's three deer. And they said, where? I said, right there. Well, I spent a lot of time in the out of doors. So it was pretty obvious to me where the three deer were. But they couldn't see them. So what I said was, well, you said, see the big pine tree? That's 12 o'clock. See the sumac bush? And they didn't know what a sumac bush. See the bush? <laughs> That's 3 o'clock. Between 12 and 3, there are three deer standing in the field. And of course, in the springtime, it's brown and the deer bl Oh, my goodness. There's three deer and lots of excitement. I think that's our job as teachers. The learning landscape is somewhat monochromatic. And it can be dull. But it's our job using whatever content, psychology, history, physical education, physics, to use the pine tree and the bush so that students can focus on something and find something exciting and relevant. One of the things when I looked up the last lecture is, one of the questions was, what have you left behind? Well, that's an interesting question. Well, I'm leaving behind a department that started with five and is now the biggest faculty in Brock University. Um, I'm leaving behind an institution that hopefully I've made some level of contribution to. And I remember when I was chair of Senate, my very first meeting, President Atkinson was sitting to my right, and one of the things I said to the senators was, I will not tolerate, as chair of Senate, ad hoc debatery. He, he went, what? I says, OK, I'll make up my own vocabulary. It's all good. So I had the uh, service on Senate. Department of Athletics, 50 banners in 10 years that are now in chron chronological order, which makes a tremendous if you will, visual display of the impact of this institution on a variety of levels. The gym restored. Uh, the gym, I bugged and bugged and bugged enough that I got, uh, was able to be an agent in getting the gym renamed after Bob Davis. I bugged enough that the, uh, the Lowenberger residence is named after Arnie Lowenberger. Um, Thousands of course conductors, tens of thousands of coaches, hundreds of thousands of athletes as part of the coaching certification program that for a while was the envy of the world. It didn't matter much to many people here, but it mattered a lot to me. Those are just tangible things though. In spite of its warts and its foibles, this is a magical place. I've looked forward to coming to work every day except three for 40 years. Dreams are uh, conceived here and realized here. This place has a magic about it that can't be found elsewhere. We are the agents of transformation. Students are transformed by their experiences here at Brock University and at our hands. I would, however, be remiss if after teaching the importance of reflection, I did not reflect somewhat on 40 years. That I had this job at all must have been a miracle to my presence, my parents. I wasn't a great student in high school. Uh, in fact, you could take three courses and add them up and still be a little bit short of 60. So it was not a uh, wonderful thing. But I always thought, uh, actually, I thought one of my teachers wanted to adopt me because I heard her over her, overheard her in the staff room say one day, boy, I'd love to be that boy's mother for just one day. <laughs> proud moment in my career. <laughs> if I had to sum up uh, 40 years, I would use four words. Service, commitment, freedom, and fulfillment. Service. I've done everything that this institution has asked of me and then maybe a little bit more. In fact, I probably only turned down two jobs, uh, one of which was being the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. <laughs> which is somewhat ironic, but it was in much better hands than, uh, than it would have been under my tutelage. I've served my department, I've served my school, I've served my province, and I've served my country. Service is the touchstone of my career. Commitment, I've never done things half measure. 
And in fact, one of the things that uh, Leanna is somewhat amazed by is my ability to focus uh, on a variety of things when they need to be done and my commitment to get them done in a timely manner. Freedom, freedom from the pressure of teaching. And that may sound like a funny statement, but it's not. Teaching is a lot of pressure. Um, before every lecture, even after 40 years, I still get nervous. I don't sleep well the night before. And I make multiple trips to the little boys' room. And in fact, one, some of the students that sit out in the lobby of the phys ed complex saw the parade back, it's just like before a game, the parade back and forth to the washroom. And when I was making one of my little trips one morning and the student goes, lecturing today? <laughs> yeah. That. The demands I put on myself in terms of this uh, endeavor have been rather large. And I don't use a lot of technology because I can't help playing. I never stop playing. I get great ideas at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And then I'll get up in the morning, shuffle things aside, and try and make the change. And I remember one time we were talking about drugs, alcohol, and smoking, and I thought, you know what? Obviously, I'm a non-smoker. I was doing triathlons and all that kind of stuff. And I said, well, maybe I'm going to take this lecture from the smoker's perspective. So I took, took a look at some of the laws. So I pulled it all together. And I'm standing there, and I'm on my soapbox. And I am going crazy. <laughs> and right down where you're sitting in the blue there, there was a student, and he obviously agitated. And I thought, good, good, it worked. I'm getting people, finally, up goes the hand. They said, sir, they repealed that law in July. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> Class dismissed. <laughs> Freedom to do the things I've put off for years, to reconnect with friends and family, to uh, visit my little piece of paradise in Tomogamy, spend some time there and recharge. And one of the other things that I find is that after 40 years, I'm amazed at how tired I am. And I'm going to recharge those batteries. Fulfillment, teaching to me has been a calling. Somehow I feel that this was what I was meant to do. I don't know, really there was no seminal moment that I can grasp, but somehow or other I was being pulled into this like iron filings to a magnet. And it has been certainly fulfilling. I've accomplished just about all that I had hoped to. One disappointment that I'm not going to dwell on, and it's not worth... Uh, coloring anything with. I have boxes of letters, notes, things in my, uh, on my wall from all aspects of all the, my professional life. I couldn't ask for more. There's a scene in, uh, some of you may remember a movie called Saving Private Ryan. Um, and I can't remember now whether it's the beginning or the end. Might be the beginning, but there's a grandfatherly person with a hairstyle much like mine, with a grandmother and a grandson. And he turns and he says, tell me I'm a good man. And it wasn't so much a statement as it was a question. And what he was really asking was, have I lived a life worthy of the investment of those people who sacrificed on my behalf? And this is actually a true story from Tonawanda, actually. It's based on a true story. I have worked with great people. Arnie Lohenberger, Bob Davis, Don Ursino, Anna Lathrop, Barry Joe, Jill Gross, Maureen Connolly, and Cheryl Mellon. I owe them a debt that I cannot repay. The Department of Athletics was 10 of the greatest years of my life. I owe them a debt. I've had the joy of working with thousands of students who have taught me more than I could ever hope to teach them. They have transformed my life, and I owe immeasurable thanks to all of them. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. 
but they will never forget how they were treated. I hope that after 40 wonderful years, that when it's time to respond to the statement, tell me I'm a good man, that this institution, the people I have worked with, the students I have taught, all the people who have invested in me can answer in the affirmative. Thank you.